Okay, I think we um, I think we might be might be ready, ready to get rolling. What do you think, Jeff? Sounds good. Okay. Well, take it away. All right. Well, welcome to this uh, beta and bruise. Uh, thank you very much for participating. We're going to talk to you about our February 2019 climb of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, with Team Kaka. Kaka. <laughs> uh, which, which consists of uh, Jeff Lawrence, Steve Rourke, uh, 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 Nell Bond, Katie Kepke, Ben Johns, and Tom Vogel, all of whom are on this call. So that's great. And we're going to talk, uh, give you a little bit of, uh, of information about the climb and, uh, and, and, and throw in a few tips as well. Uh, the agenda will be, we'll go over a few Zoom uh, guidelines, uh, do a little Mountaineers intro, uh, do an overview of the route. Uh, interspersed in the presentations will be 10 tips, uh, 10 tips for a great climb with a few miscellaneous stories mixed in, some gear planning and recommendations, and then a list of resources at the end. So um, everyone has been muted except for me and Tom. So please stay on mute so that others uh, can hear. Um, you can also turn off your camera if you want, uh, just so we, we say bandwidth. Um, this is being recorded for future use. Uh, in fact, if you would turn off your camera, that'd be appreciated. So it's just so we can, uh, we can get, uh, we, can, uh, we can make sure we have as uh, clear a presentation as we can. Uh, if, if you have any questions, please type those into the chat window and we'll try to get to those as we go on. We'll also have some time at the end and at the end, use the raise hands feature on the, uh, uh, on the Zoom video and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And, and then lastly, if you'd uh, be so kind as to send us some uh, feedback after the event, these are great to have a little bit of, uh, uh, to be able to have a little bit of communion and, uh, and to be able to get together in lieu of uh, being able to go out with all of our, our uh, friends in the mountain, which, which is which where we really wanna be, particularly on a day like this. So, um, so the Mountaineers, I think that uh, the most of the people here are aware of who the Mountaineers, or uh, who the Mountaineers are. I am in, uh, in the Mountaineers Tacoma Program Center. Uh, I, live, uh, I live just down the, or up the hill from the Tacoma Program Center. Uh, so I have easy access to it. We were, we were founded in 1906. We have over 14,000 members, branches in Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Bellingham, Everett, Foothills, and Kitsap. We're 501c3, so that means we're funded by donations, uh, uh, memberships, and course fees. Uh, like many people in nonprofits, the Mountaineers have been really hard hit by the financial impacts of COVID-19. So if you're in a position to make a gift, uh, I'd encourage you to do so in support of the Mountaineers people places in the books who have touched your lives. Uh, gifts of any size go a long way. Um, the uh, crowdsourcing element really makes a difference in, uh, in, in helping uh, protect our organization's core, core operations and uh, core principles. So, so the primary reason, or the, I should say, the, uh, the inspiration for our trip is that, uh, is that my daughter uh, lives in Rwanda, uh, which is a, a Central East Africa country in the mountains. It's at about, it, it's at about a mile high. Uh, beautiful country. It's, uh, as you can see, bordered by Tanzania, uh, Uganda, the, De the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, so, so my wife and I were going to go visit uh, my daughter uh, and her husband, uh, uh, Nathan, and, and my grandson, Del. Hey, Delly, if you're listening, hi, buddy. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, Steve Rourke and I, who was one of the members of the trip and who was on the, uh, who's on the call as well, he and I have uh, been climbing partners for a long time. Uh, back in 2011, we climbed Aconcagua, uh, had a great time. We were looking for another interesting international experience. And so we had uh, Kilimanjaro on our sights. 
And uh, so this is the this is a great impetus. When I talked to Tom about this, he says, "Yeah, let's let's go." And uh, so we did. So um, just a, a few kind of uh, facts about Kili, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a massive mountain. Um, one of the things I was struck by when we arrived in Moshi, which was um, which was our, the little town that we were staying in before our climb, is that literally you can't even you can't even see the entire breadth of the mountain without turning your head from side to side. It's absolutely incredible. And it's because it's got actually three different volcanic cones: uh, Moenzi, Kibo, and Shira, are are the are really kind of um, are what. Uh, constitute Kilimanjaro, but um, it is the highest point in Africa. It's one of the seven summits, and it's about 16,000 feet from its base to the summit at 19,300 19, feet. So there's a lot of climbing on this. You know, if you um, put that in perspective, uh, Mount Rainier, we all know, is um, 14,411 feet or 10 feet. And so, um, you know, so Kilimanjaro from its base is higher than, than Mount Rainier. So it's pretty Incredible. About 30,000 people attend uh, about 75%. So um, to put that in comparison to uh, Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier is about 50%. Um, and um, there, there are, it's not, it's not a completely risk-free mountain in terms of the seven summits. Um, there's about 10 people that die on Kili every year for a variety of reasons, um, but it, it can be done really pretty safely. And it's a very old mountain as well, um, but a, an amazing place. If you're thinking about climbing Kelly, um, the very first thing that you'd want to think about, or one of the first things you want to think about, is um, what route to do. And like many big mountains, there are a lot of routes to um, to choose from. And you know, some of them are very, uh, very kind of well traveled and and really um, you know populated with uh, with guides and you know different amenities on the mountain and everything. And then some are, are much less off the, off the beaten path. And early on, as Jeff and I were talking about it, as we started to talk to various other folks that were uh, going to uh, be participants on this trip, we decided we wanted to do something that wasn't, you know, kind of the standard route. So we started to do some research. And, you know, the first step of that is, you know, you just Google like, hey, which, which route should I use to climb Kilimanjaro? And it comes, comes up with tons and tons of different res resources. And if you're thinking about it, you know, I'd really encourage you to do a lot of reading and get a sense of the different routes because they are pretty different from one another. And um, that leads us to our, our tip number one is that, um, at least from our standpoint, we really loved the fact that we got off the beaten path. And the Western Breach is one of the, le the least climbed routes on the mountain. And it, it really led to a terrific experience. We really had a, a wonderful um, time as a result of, um, of making that choice. So, you know, doing some of the research here, you know, you've got like this, the standard routes um, like Mashami and Morangu um, that are, you know, are 45% and 40% of the, of the total climbs. And you go on down and we, we ran across this one called Umbwe and it says 0%. And then we're like, well, you know, it's the difficulty is very high. The scenery is very good and the traffic is very low. And that, that we, we were like, okay, that, that sounds like, that sounds like our kind of climb. Um, but then we were, you know, we were starting to look at the actual route itself and there's a lot of variations, you know, the reality is that, you know, a lot of these trails, they interconnect with one another and so you can do some variations. And so we're looking at the Umbwe route and, and typically what it does is it goes up through Umbwe Cave, uh, Barranco, and then it sort of goes over to the east through Karanga up to Barafu and then to the peak. And the, you know, the doubt we had about that was Barafu is like a really big camp, very, you know, very crowded and everything else. And we could, you know, do, do something that's a little bit different from that. And then we ran across this idea of um, what's called the Western Breach. And if you Google Western Breach, and this is literally a screenshot of the Google um, page, it, the ver very first thing that comes up is uh, Western Breach Accident 2015, Kilimanjaro deaths 2017, there's the tragedy on, on Kilimanjaro, and, and frankly, I think it's a little bit overblown, um, but there is, some, there is some objective danger on this route, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but when you dig into it, it also is one of the most beautiful routes, and, and it's really an amazing experience. And so, you know, if you're going to think about the Western Breach, I would, I would encourage you to read about some of the accidents that have occurred, and um, 
and think about your risk profile, but I do think that the Western breach can be done safely and um, and so we'll we'll talk more about what you know why why we made that decision and what it's what it's like. But um, but it, you know if you're thinking about this route, I would definitely um, you know take a look at some of those um, some of those statistics and whatnot. And um, and this is a this is a Google um, Earth image of um, of the Western Breach, and you can see it right in the middle there. Um, Arrow Glacier Camp that's indicated on here is where our high camp was before we did our summit. And you can see this massive, um, it's just basically like a rock slide that's down the side of the mountain. And I think it was either, you know, it was either a, 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 a big rock slide that happened, you know, many thousands of years ago or some kind of a volcanic event. But it created this feature that um, it, um, it's, it's amazingly beautiful. And, um, there's a lot of loose rock as a result of it, but it's um, but it's also you know a really pretty amazing route as as well. Um, I'm going to stop for just a quick second and see if um, if Safe or Innocent or Moody or Rashid are are with us. And, and if so, I wanted to ask Rashid or Moody a, a quick question. So, Rashid or Moody, are either either one of you there? If you're I there, see. you can just indicate in the chat. Yeah, and I see I see safe is on, which is great. Oh, excellent! All right, but I'm not sure about. Um, well, we'll come back. We'll come back to safe here in, in just in just a minute. But hopefully, Rashid and um, and Moody and Innocent will be able to join us at some point as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the um, about the the Umbue, uh Western Breach Route, and here's um, that same map that kind of shows what our what our actual route was. So we kind of went up here on the Umbwe itself to Bronco Huts, then up to Lava Tower, to Arrow Glacier, we summited, and then came back down to what's called Millennium Camp, and then back out the Mueca um, was, was the route we ended up doing. So it's a little bit of a, of a hybrid route. Back to you, Jeff. Great. Yeah, so uh, tip number two, uh, climb with a good group, and buy out an entire climb if you can. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody about the importance of group dynamics. Uh, that can make or break a climb, that can make and break an outing, that can make or break a hike. So, uh, you know, you gotta know the people who you're with. And uh, if you're able to buy out a climb, uh, as we did with uh, Kili Africa Tours, we had, we had only six participants, but that was, uh, that was not an unreasonable amount. And then we were able to get rid of uh, all of the um, all of the risk of being uh, combined with some other participants with whom we might not uh, uh, match too well. And uh, I think we we probably all have examples of that. And so uh, that's something that we really didn't want to do. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure how uh, how we determined that the name of the team was Team Kaka, <laughs> but we uh, one of the first nights that we went out in, uh, or for the first days we went out to uh, looking for lunch in um, uh, in uh, in Moshi before the climb, where we uh, after we got there and we're and we're looking around for a place to eat, we got a recommendation for this place. We saw we saw Kakas, and we thought that that kind of cemented that that this uh, this absolutely should be Team Kaka. So that's uh, that's who we are. And uh, there's uh, my friend Moody, who's there in the in the corner with uh, Team Kaka, uh, who we'll introduce in just a moment. So um, Team Kaka is is myself, uh, Steve Rourke, who is uh, uh, who's my climbing partner and. Uh, and so Steve and I have climbed a lot. Uh, as I mentioned, we went to, to, uh, to Aconcagua in 2011, had a successful summit there, and just had a fantastic time. And I think that, that really what uh, uh, cemented it uh, with Steve is that we not only had a great time on the mountain, but, but we got done early and we spent and we spent a week in town drinking wine and eating steaks, and that kind of that kind of cemented that yeah, this is a guy who I who I who I like to spend time with. Uh, so anyway, that was a that's a big indication. So, so we had to do another one in El Kilimanjaro. Uh, Katie is a, a friend of Tom's, and her climbing buddy is Nell. 
And so I thought, okay, I can, I can go with, a, I can go with a, a friend of Tom's, but, uh, and uh, then by kind of transition, we can go to Nell. And, and I think if, uh, if everything he says about how great Katie is, if, if, uh, if Nell is half that good, then we're, then we're okay. So that was our, uh, 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 those were our next two. And, uh, and a round out uh, was uh, Tom Vogel, who's uh, sporting the Moss mustache, which, uh, which I've, actually, uh, I've actually taught my grandson how to do. He likes to do Moss mustache too. You'd be happy to know, Tom. And uh, Ben Johns. And, and I will say that they shared a tent, uh, but, that, uh, but the photograph in the lower left-hand corner has nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, tip number three is go local. And uh, so we, when Tom and I were talking about this, Tom had uh, had the idea that he wanted to do a collaborative climb. That we wanted to do, that we wanted to get a get a group, and we wanted to have guides and porters and so forth with whom we could be peers and climb with and enjoy ourselves. And uh, so, uh, actually, uh, uh, Safe Juma who is uh, uh, shown here on the, uh, on the screen, who, who you'll hear from in just a moment, is the, uh, is the CEO, the founder, and the owner of, uh, of uh, Keeley Africa Tours. And he reached out to Tom via a, a Facebook friend request. Uh, and uh, Tom responded, and he was so responsive. And we communicated a lot over the... Uh, over the ensuing half a year or eight months or nine months or whatever it was. And uh, we ended up hiring him and uh, Stace is a pretty amazing guy. I mean, at this, at this time, I think he was, uh, he was at the ripe old age of 29. Uh, so uh, he's, he's an old man now, maybe at uh, 30 or 31, but uh, he's got an incredible outfit. And it's, uh, if, we can, if, we can cue, if we can cue Safe now, I think he's on the line. So uh, Safe, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about uh, Keeley Africa Tours and, and a little bit about the guides and, and a little bit about what you're doing with uh, staying local there in Tanzania and in Moshi. And Safe, I think I unmuted you, so you should be able to talk now. Sure. Um, if you can turn your, let's see, can we turn your volume up a little bit? Um, yeah, the uh, question is safe. Uh, we just wanted you to talk a little bit about the importance of, uh, of having a local guide uh, rather than, uh, uh, than a large international company. Okay, yeah, of course, uh, you know, uh, you guys, uh, when you are, are planning to make a visit in Tanzania, it means you have some uh, goals. You want to come to Tanzania to explore the beauty of, uh, of Tanzania, but also to support the local people. So uh, if you book your trip- Yeah, with local so provider, um, as I understand, you use a lot of the, of the same- Jeff, it sounds like it sounds like uh, maybe your your connection got froze up there. Safe, um, yeah. If you if you could, you know, maybe just talk talk a little bit more about like the ways that um, that you know working with the local guide service really benefits um, the community in a bigger way than going through a larger uh, you know international type guide service. <clears throat> well. Uh, so uh, I was about uh, to say that uh, if you book with a local tour provider, it means you are supporting the local people directly because we, the local tour providers, we work with the local people. So we are employing the, the local people. So it means your finances is going to help the local people directly uh, uh, instead of booking your trip with the middleman, uh, with the overseas company. 
uh, which actually they do uh, some contracting the, the deal to the local people. After you confirm the deal with the overseas company, and then because they don't have the licenses to run the business in Tanzania directly, so they have to subcontract the, the, the deal to the local people, to the local tro uh, provider, uh, of which you can see uh, because uh, the overseas company wants to make some, uh, some profit. Uh, while the same same uh, uh, local tour provider also is looking to make uh, some profit, so you can see your your money is just uh, being cut off in uh, in these two uh, uh, business holders, the overseas company and the local uh, tour provider. So uh, your finance is not going to help the local people as much as you can think. Uh, more than uh, if you book your trip uh, with the local tour provider directly uh, and they avoid those uh, middlemen people. So as the local tour provider, we work with the local people. So if you book your trip directly with the local tour provider, it means you're helping the local people at large. Yeah. Thanks, Safe. And, um, you know, the other, the other thing that I really um, appreciate about, about Safe is, um, is that there's, there's actually not a lot of women who have opportunities working on the mountain now as guides or porters, but, um, but Safe has really been progressive at, um, at creating opportunities for, uh, for the, the women there in Tanzania to, to get involved in, in guiding and being porters. So that's, um, that's another thing that's really, that's really cool. Um, Jeff, are you, um, are you back with us? Um, I don't hear Jeff. I'm going to, con I'm going to continue on, but Jeff, if you are, if you come back in with us, um, let me know and can pick back, pick back up with your slides. So as Jeff, as Jeff said, you know, um, I, I got to know it, um, safe on, um, on Facebook actually. And, he, um, you know, he and I talked to it before we, uh, before we um, made our trip to uh, Tanzania. And, um, and one of the things that was really cool about uh, working with, uh, with Kili Africa Tours was that we wanted to do a trip that was a little bit unusual where we had an itinerary that was, uh, that was you know, kind of, um, you know, customized to what we wanted to accomplish. But we also wanted to, we wanted to climb um, like we were peers. And, and so it was really nice being able to, um, to have that, you know, that level of collaboration with our, with our guides, uh, Rashid, Innocent, and Moody, who are really terrific. And you can see here, these, these are some pictures um, of both our guides and porters, and they work really hard. They, um, they, they call themselves mountain warriors, and they are very deserving of that title. Here's another, another picture of of our crew, we had, we had a big we had a big crew. You know, we had six of us, and um, we had three guides, a cook, and twenty three porters. And and I think actually uh, we packed a little bit lighter than than any groups do, and so we were able to uh, we were able to have a, like a slightly smaller group of porters. But um, you know, it uh, it sounds like a really big group, but it, um, it it contributes to a great experience, and you're. You know, you're supporting a lot of a lot of jobs by by climbing on Kili with um, with uh, with a group like this. Yeah, we'll talk about the cook a little bit later on. Oh, there we go, Jeff. You're back. I'm back. Okay, I'll let you take back over. Yeah, so I think I um, I think I'm about ready to hand it off to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a group. This is actually we had we had intended to start with a uh, start with a celebration at the, on the last day where we had a. Uh, last day at the Millennium Camp, where we we're going to uh, climb, uh, come down the rest of the way. We came about halfway down to uh, to the Millennium Camp, and we spent the night there uh, before we came down to the gate, uh, 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 the Borke Gate, the last day. But uh, but this is a picture, a still picture of the group of uh, of uh, guys and porters and the cook cooks uh, uh, on that uh, on that morning but uh, just just an outstanding uh, group of people we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go on terrific so um, so Moshi um, is the town in um, Tanzania east of the International Airport Kilimanjaro International Airport which um, is uh, sort of equidistant to 
from Moshi and, and a bigger town called Arusha. And that's where most people start their, uh, start their, start their trip. And that's where we started. And that leads us to tip number four, which is don't be in a rush. Um, you know, and I would, I would um, say that, you know, for the entire trip, um, pole pole, um, go slowly. And part of that is, you know, coming, coming to Tanzania on the front end of the trip, it's a long flight. You have to fly either through, um, through Amsterdam, some people fly through, uh, through Dubai, but it's about 10 hours to get to either Dubai or, um, or Amsterdam. You have a layover, then it's another 10 hours to get down to, um, to uh, Tanzania. And so you're gonna, be, you're gonna be wiped out. So have a couple of days at least on the front end. And one of the things that allows you to do is like have some really cool experiences. This was a picture of Steve, um, uh, or uh, a friend of the trip. Um, where you can buy art, you can um, you know, do eco tours, um, a plantation tour of a coffee plantations. There's a lot, of, a lot to do, but um, but don't be in a rush. And, and we had a lot of fun actually, uh, just hanging out in Moshi, going out, walking the town, going to the local markets, um, eating some of the local foods. So it's a it's a way that you can have you can extend your experience and then be well rested when you when you actually get on the mountain itself. There's a couple other photos of that. So after all that, you get rested up, you do your gear check, and, and you're ready to go. And so for us, day one was from Umbwe Gate to Umbwe uh, Cave Camp. So it's um, uh, a little over 3,000 vertical feet for us on the first day. And it was primarily in rainforest. And, um, you know, for, for us uh, coming from the Pacific Northwest, it was quite a bit warmer than what we're used to. But um, it actually looked kind of familiar. A lot of, you know, very lush uh, trees or monkeys up in the trees and um, really beautiful flowers and everything. And one of the things I was struck by is um, when you get ready for your trip, um, all, of the, all of the porters have to weigh their loads that they're carrying, their shared loads. And that's to ensure that, you know, the people aren't over carrying these really big, heavy loads and everything. I think many years ago, the, the especially weren't treated very well on the mountain and they didn't have great conditions in terms of sleeping or eating and they were carrying them to make things uh, better better conditions for uh, for our porters so this is a picture at uh, Umbwe Gate um, of the porters weighing in their loads and um, I think about 33 to 35 pounds is the limit of what they can carry. Um, one of the other things that's really cool about, about Kilimanjaro is you go through all these different ecological zones. There's four or five distinct ecological zones. We started off in the rainforest and then you get into the moorland or the heather, then to this highland desert um, area, and then finally in the Arctic. And one of the things that's um, striking about that, if you look at these, um, these me median temperature ranges, is that you could go from 80 degrees Fahrenheit at the base of Kili to zero degrees at the summit and, and or even colder. So some pretty extreme temperatures. And um, so keep that in mind when we talk about our recommended um, gear, gear packing. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of us uh, walking up um, the trail, starting off from, uh, from Umbwe Gate. And um, you can see this, uh, this picture of this, this porter. I can't remember if this is, uh, this might be Gordon actually who is carrying the, um, our table that from the dining tent on his back, which is kind of amazing. And you'll see, you know, other pictures of the other porters working so hard to provide a great experience for the, for the guests. And, you know, here's another, another picture, which, uh, you know, this could almost look like, you know, like it's in the Pacific Northwest here. Um, very lush, we're in short sleeves and shorts and, you know, we were all pretty sweaty by the time we got into, into Umbwe, um, Mboy Cave Camp. There's a picture of Nell. Um, one of the things that was also really cool is like every day you got in and the porters had gone had gone ahead way faster than us carrying big loads and they would have all your tents set up. They would have hot water for you to wash up. There'd be um, you know food available. So they really took great care of us and you know it's um, I think a lot of us are used to doing hikes or climbs where we're very self-sufficient and we get in, we do our own tents and all that. Um, but it was, it was really nice. Um, I, um, I really liked the experience of, um, of, uh, of, you know, working with our porters, but then getting in and, and kind of having that, uh, you know, that, that experience when you got into camp of 
having all your stuff ready to go. Godson. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so uh, tip number five is uh, hire a good cook. And uh, so uh, our cook's name was Godson. Um, when we arrived in, uh, in Moshi and we got situated in the, in the hotel, uh, first of all, Safe and his team picked everybody up at the airport, uh, took us to our hotels, gave us uh, delicious bananas and uh, uh, the bottles of water, got to the hotel. And then it was either the first night or the second night, he brought the, uh, he brought the team with the guys and of course the uh, stomach engineer, Godson, <laughs> in to meet the team. And uh, so we, uh, that's a very important part of the, uh, of the trip. Uh, I, I uh, have some, uh, some dietary restrictions. I am, I am, I am a celiac, so uh, I was a little bit concerned about that. You know, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, spend the entire trip in the bathroom. And so I was a little bit concerned about, uh, uh, about, uh, about my diet on there. But, uh, but I got to say that they, uh, uh, that they catered to uh, every need that they, either I or anybody else had, and and uh, we we ate like kings. I want everyone to note also that Godson entrusted the eggs to nobody else but himself to carry on his back. <laughs> yes, those yeah, are fresh the, eggs. Those, yeah, that, that this little green uh, these green cartons up here. These are fresh eggs that, that he carried all the way all the way up and down the mountain. Incredible. So, um, so we had uh, we had uh, three squares uh, a day uh, when we would arrive. This is this happens to be at the uh, at the lava tower camp, but when we would arrive at the camp, uh, typically, as Tom mentioned, our tents would be set up. Uh, the mess tent, which was this uh, uh, blue tent uh, with the with the comfy seating uh, and uh, and the bottles of water, uh, were always set up in advance of when we got there um, and uh, so for every meal we uh, Godson and the Saidi who was his assistant uh, started out with started out with a lot of hot tea I mean there's a lot of emphasis on hydration as, as a lot of us know it's uh, uh, it's always or it's uh, uh, sometimes hard to remember to hydrate so there was hot tea and coffee that was available all the time and every meal started with hot soup and so we were able to get a lot of the hydration through hot soup, uh, followed by followed by a main course, and followed by dessert. Uh, lots of fresh fruits, lots of fresh veggies. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I lose my appetite when I'm when I'm on trips, and so it was often pretty hard to consume it all. But it was always always really great and. Uh, you know, the hydration part was the most important. I mean, there were just absolutely delicious soups and the, and the meals were, were fantastic. I think as you can see in the front here, there's a, uh, uh, there are uh, fresh avocados and uh, so, the, so the meals were fantastic. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, uh, lots, of, lots of hydration, lots of good food. Uh, we were able to generate a lot of, uh, of, of of heat in the tents, and uh, Godson was always there and happy. And he, he would, uh, he had a he had a good collection of uh, of uh, uh, aprons too. Uh, so he had, I think, an apron from every client who who he'd ever who he'd ever cooked for. And so every day, every meal, it seemed like he came came to to serve the meal with a different apron. So we were we were very impressed with that. Um, so, um, uh, day two was the Umboy Cave to Bronco, uh, camp. And I have to say, I was, I was happy to, I was happy to leave Umboy Cave. It was very, it was a very hot day, uh, very sticky getting there. It was kind of, uh, kind of a hot, uncomfortable night. But this was, uh, in my estimation, this was the most beautiful day. Um, so, um, this is going through the moorland about uh, about 9,300 to um, 12,700, and uh, pole pole is uh, is a Swahili uh, word for slowly, uh, take it slow, softly, gently, uh, and uh, so there was constant uh, constant admin, uh, admonitions to the group, pole pole, hey, there's no hurry. 
Uh, enjoy the trip. Uh, uh, we'll get there. Uh, uh, look around and enjoy yourselves. And so that was uh, that was a very actually very comforting when uh, we were saying, "Hey, this you know I'm I'm kind of tired or uh, uh, I'm not keeping up." Uh, that uh, that the pole pole was uh, was a good admonition. Um, we got out of the out of the rainforest and got onto a ridge. Most of the walking was on a ridge. There was incredible uh, there was incredible flora. Uh, there's a lot of moss. A lot of interesting uh, a lot of interesting things to see. Uh, one of the things which, which I meant to point out is that uh, to get to be a guide on Kilimanjaro is not an easy thing to do. Uh, you've got to go through a lot of training. First of all, you have to be a porter. Uh, you have to be a porter for a certain amount of time, and you have to go through a lot of education. And a lot of education, you have to learn a lot of the flora, the fauna. You have to learn, uh, uh, have to learn wilderness first aid. There's a lot of training that you have to do to become a porter. And so this is really when that paid off. Um, so, the, so the guides were incredible. Uh, Rashid and Moody and uh, uh, Innocent were able to tell us about, uh, tell us about the, uh, the, uh, the flora, uh, uh, explain, about, um, uh, explain about what we were seeing, and there were lots of interesting stories about a lot of the stuff. And I think if you go to the next slide, we'll see an uh, incredible view of the mountain. Now this is just another trip up. Uh, it was there was it was kind of alternating, uh, alternating steep climbing with a, with a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, again, this is another another one of the of the porters. I'm not even sure I know the name of this porter, but uh, um, you know they were uh, uh, they were kind of passing us by as we were uh, pole poleing and enjoying the view. But this is this is one of the views from the ridge line. It was an incredibly beautiful day when we were going going up uh, on this day. And there's, there's a view of the mountain from the ridge. Uh, yeah, another picture, the uh, trees on the left. Uh, so we had a, we had a really, good, um, really good description by Rashid and by, uh, and by Innocent about these trees. And I can't remember any of it, not Rashid, uh, sorry. But, uh, but it, was, it, was, it was very interesting. I mean, these, these trees, they, uh, they collect moisture, I guess, in the wintertime. There isn't a lot of snow now, but they, uh, but they, grow, uh, they collect moisture in the, upper, in the upper parts and they're able to survive because, uh, because in past years, the snows would be all the way up to where, that, uh, where the dead portion of those uh, trees are. And they're able to survive with the upper parts of those trees by, uh, by collecting the moisture and by growing. Uh, uh, in the winter, uh, in the uh, summertime. And Jeff, we do have Rashid now with us as well. So, oh, hi, Rashid. oh yeah, Rashid. Maybe we should. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the education, or a little bit about uh, about what you have to have to go through to uh, to become a guide. I think I have you unmuted. If you want to. Or maybe your microphone's not on. Anyway, Rashid is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, we'll see some other pictures of Rashid. There is a, actually there's another picture later on where he's giving a tutorial on this incredible on this incredible plant that uh, w was actually one of the spikes from this uh, from this plant on the right. Uh, on my left is my friend Innocent who uh, actually is a very good guide. And uh, uh, we, uh, we really enjoyed the uh, company of all the guides and uh, they, all, they all actually went with us to the summit, uh, 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 them and a couple of porters. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, another really interesting thing was that the guides um, often don't get to do go on the interesting kind of climbs that they really want to do, like the Western Breach. And so that was a feature that they were able to do uh, with this trip, which they were excited about. Now, there's Rashid. And uh, Rashid, I forget what that plant's called, but it's an amazing plant. These, uh, these spikes grow up, and I think that's the same no, that's that's not the same plant as we were looking at before. But that's uh, but uh, but uh, just believe, uh, before we were getting get to the Barranco camp, we stopped and we had a tutorial about this incredible plant uh, with with Rashid uh, educating us on uh, on a lot of the flora on the way up there. 
Um, this picture of uh, Barranco Camp is just as we arrived, and this was in the afternoon. It's 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 kind of amazing that there that uh, uh, that despite the pictures that we've seen uh, up to now, that often in the evenings there's a lot of rain, and so this was just when the rain was starting to come in. And the next picture is a picture of the Barranco Camp, and this is really one of the beauties of taking the Umbway route. We this is the other than on the way down at the Millennium Camp, this was uh, this was one of the most crowded camps that we that we stayed in. And uh, Tom, I don't know if you've advanced that yet, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a picture of the uh, of the Bronco Camp. There's a lot of it's the intersection of a lot of trails, and um, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of folks there. Our uh, our team got there earlier. We were able to uh, set up very good camp spots, but uh, but this was really one of the beauties of the of the route we took. The, the, we this was kind of the exception rather than the rule of the kind of camps we had, as you'll see later. Um, so the next day was from from the Bronco Camp to Lava Tower Camp, uh, about uh, twelve thousand eight hundred to uh, just just over fifteen thousand feet. And this is a Highland Desert. This was another great day. It wasn't a very long day. But uh, it's going through some beautiful, beautiful countryside uh, with expansive views of the mountain. Um, the, um, as, we, as we went up, we had a lot of fun because it was, uh, it was a relatively short day. Uh, it was more open. Uh, there were all these interesting, uh, it, interesting plants again. Uh, and there were uh, views of the mountain all the way up and uh, coming in and out of clouds, and uh, at the end of the at, uh, at the end of the trip, there's a there's a great view of the lava tower. Oh, this is uh, yeah, this is one of the great views of the uh, uh, of the mountain in the background. This is about uh, three quarters of the way up from the Bronco Camp to Lava Tower, and then the uh, next picture uh, uh, again, just approaching the Lava Tower, which is on the right. And then the next one is a uh, picture of the, of, the lava, of the Lava Tower Camp uh, itself, which is, uh, uh, it's actually another intersection of a lot of the, of the trails, but it's not nearly as heavily, uh, heavily camped as the Bronco Camp or some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that, that, that was interesting about Lava Tower is that it's, um, it's actually used as a stopping off point uh, for many people to acclimatize. So Lava Tower is about 16,000 feet and or a little less than 16,000 feet. And so people um, will often come up to Lava Tower, have lunch, and then will go down to a camp like Barranco where they can, you know, kind of climb high, sleep low. So that's a, you know, it's a way of, of acclimatizing. Um, which leads us to tip number seven, which, um, you know, Jeff already talked about this before, eat, drink, and rest well. Um, you know, one of the keys to feeling good on a long trip like this and, and especially going to higher elevation is, um, is to really, you know, really kind of practice just typical um, self-care in terms of, you know, your hydration especially, but, um, but really eating even when you don't feel like it. Um, and then trying to rest where, whenever you can. And sometimes, you know, the resting might be just, you know, getting in in the afternoon and having a little bit of a nap or, you know, trying to get to bed early. But, um, but it's really essential to feeling good on the trip. Um, this was kind of fun. We, we stopped at 14,411 uh, feet, the, uh, the, uh, the elevation of Mount Rainier. And it looks, it looks more desolate here than it actually was. This is Nell and Innocent and myself. Um, but there still are plants up here. There are birds flying around. It's kind of amazing. You know, you think about, you know, for those of you that have, um, that have climbed Mount Rainier, how desolate it is. And, you know, it's usually just howling wind and freezing cold. And here we are, you know, with, without even jackets on and, and there's plants and birds. And it was really, it was really fun. So that was, that was a nice experience. So here's some more shots of us at, at Lava Tower. You can see um, in this picture, we are, we are wearing like all of our clothing. Um, <laughs> Nell, Nell looks freezing. We actually we all look freezing. It got really cold at Lava Tower. Um, and you can also see, um, it's interesting this picture in the upper right, that um, there's, uh, there's almost no other tents at this point. 
And I think we were one of maybe two groups that were actually camped at Lava Tower coming through and going down to Bronco, um, but very few groups were actually camping up at Lava Tower. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous. It was one of my favorite camps on the mountains. Mm. So then we uh, get to day four where things start to, you know, really get interesting. So, um, so Lava Tower um, is, um, is about 15,000 feet. I said 16 um, earlier, but um, we, we then hiked up to, um, to Arrow Glacier, which is about 16,000 feet. So not a lot of elevation gain, but we were all starting to really feel the altitude at that point, And you're really getting into the Arctic zone. Um, so this is a view back towards Lava Towers. We were heading up to, um, to Arrow Glacier. And one of the things that's striking about like this, this picture down in the lower right is there's nobody else around. Um, and when we got up to, when we got up to Arrow Glacier, there were, there were no other groups there. There was one other group that, that, um, that came in and that was on the route when we, when we did our summit attempt. But, um, but, you know, really nobody else up there. And, um, and, and that's part of the, part of the wonder, the, you know, the, the wonderful beauty of this route is that you're just, you know, you're not, not um, you see, we're all starting to look a little tired, uh, taking some rests here. This is, I think, almost, um, this might be actually at Arrow Glacier itself, um, but you can see that it's, um, it's starting to get pretty desolate. So this is a, a picture of Arrow Glacier itself, and you start to get a sense of what we were climbing up the next day um, as we headed up the Western Breach. And this is a picture um, that I took, actually. I think I climbed up on the ridge above camp, and you can see that we've got our three tents and the mess tent and a couple of other tents for reporters and guides. But, um, but other than that, we were, we were pretty, pretty lonely at Arrow Glacier. That brings us to tip number eight, which is to uh, manage your climatization really carefully. And um, we, um, we did this trip as a seven day itinerary and our original plan, we'll talk in here in a few minutes about, um, about our summit day, but our original um, intent was to go from Arrow Glacier up the Western Breach and then sleep at the, um, at the crater and then do our summit and then come back down. And, um, and we, we decided actually, uh, we kind of made an audible on the morning that we were heading out from, uh, from Western Breach to, um, to go up and over the mountain um, summit and then come back down to Millennium in part because we were kind of concerned about um, going all the way up over 19,000 feet and then um, sleeping you know, yet again high and then working our way down. And that was really um, you know, kind of a judgment call that we made in conferring with, um, with our guides um, to, to make sure that, that we were doing well from, from, a, um, from a, an altitude standpoint. Um, you can see this picture here of Ben and, ben and Steve, and I think I probably looked similar, but you know, we were all choking down food at this point. You know, none of us really had much of an appetite at 16,000 feet, and it certainly wasn't because of uh, Godson's cooking. It was just that we were all, you know, sure. starting to feel it. Um, and um, uh, about half of our team was, uh, was taking Diamox at that point, um, just to, to help to control the, you know, the feelings of altitude sickness. Um, but like I said, we, um, we woke up, um, the next morning and, um, and decided that, um, you know, that it might be a better idea for us for, for a couple of different reasons to, um, to alter our it itinerary. Originally we were planning on having, um, all of our porters go, up the breach with us, um, camping at the um, at the crater, and then heading down. We were also a little bit worried about um, about the porters and and carrying those heavy loads up the western breach. And so, we uh, we got together with Rashid and Moody and Innocent, and we discussed our you know our concerns and and we talked about it. And we decided that we were going to do one big push, go to the summit, and then meet um, the rest of our group back over at Millennium Camp, which is down mm -hmm. a little bit over 12,000 feet. So we ended up uh, climbing the Western Breeze just with, um, with our party, our three guides, and two porters, and then sent the rest of the group around the mountain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I gotta say, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the features, uh, we were taking such good care of. Every evening in the mess tent at the end of dinner, we would have a, we'd have a team meeting and, uh, and Rashid, who is the head guide, would come in with the other guys and we'd talk about the next day and about what we're gonna do. And that was after we did, uh, we did uh, 
uh, we did oxygen saturation levels and we, we talked about how we felt and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of care going on to really kind of assess hey uh, where is this team how are they doing what can they handle uh, so we we met uh, that that night. And, uh, and as Tom said, we did an audible and we said, hey, you know, instead of taking the whole group up, we're, you know, let's, uh, let's go up with, uh, with the three guys, with, uh, uh, with Rashid and with Innocent and with Moody and uh, two, of the, uh, two of the porters, uh, John and Salim, and, uh, and, then, and then the rest will go around and they'll meet us at the Millennium Camp. Uh, and that was, that was a really good call. I mean, um, I think you see that the carry all this gear up the Western Breach probably uh, isn't, uh, uh, I don't think would have been a real good decision. Uh, so at any rate, that's, that's the decision we made. Uh, and we got a, got a relatively early start. Uh, this was this is a little bit of the, of the way up after we had gotten going. This is probably, this is probably 5.30 or 6 uh in the morning uh you know it's almost on the equator so you have uh, almost equal almost equal day and night uh so um uh and and i gotta say there uh, there really isn't a tremendous amount of objective danger here anymore and i think that's probably because there isn't a lot of ice and snow anymore uh, unfortunately uh but uh you know the objective danger on this uh, on this route was a lot less than a lot of stuff that, that we'll see here in the Northwest on any, any outing. So, I mean, we felt, we felt very comfortable, uh, very comfortable doing it. Uh, another thing about that was, that was really cool is that, uh, uh, is that the, uh, I talked to uh, Innocent and Rashid and Moody who were the guides and they've had a lot of years of guiding and they've guided a lot of trips. And I think, that they had been up the Western Breach maybe two to four times each ever. And so it's just not that uh, common an occurrence that they go up the Western Breach and they were excited to go up. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that they really, really like to do. And it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting route. It's a really beautiful route. And so they were, they were very excited and there were a couple of the other porters who were very interested in going up too. And they were, they were great additions to the team as well. So um, yeah, there's, uh, uh, there were some absolutely beautiful views on the way up. Um, it was a cold, crisp, but not uncomfortable morning. Um, it, was, uh, it was below freezing, uh, but uh, probably not a lot below freezing. And uh, Tom, I don't know if you're advancing the uh, screen, uh, but um, you know, we took, um, uh, we took helmets, um, and, uh, and I think the majority of us took some micro spikes. I think I wore micro spikes for, for a little bit of the way. Uh, I don't think every, everybody did. Uh, crampons were needed. We all carried crampons as well because uh, we're not really sure about what the conditions are going to be. But uh, I'd say that it's, um, it's, it's challenging, but it's challenging because of the altitude, not necessarily because of the, of the climbing. I'd say it's uh, class one and two uh, with some, with some short, uh, short sections of class three scrambling uh, on the route up. Uh, but uh, with the altitude at nearly uh, uh, 18 and a half or 19,000 feet, it was a little bit uh, slow going. Um, so, um, as I say, there isn't a lot of objective risks. There's not a lot of snow. There's not a lot of ice. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of uh, places that I could see that there could be a lot of releases with the warming temperatures as the, as the day wore on. But there, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely beautiful. You can see on the picture on the right, um, this, was, this was near the top. Uh, we went through a lot of scree and uh, talus fields on the way up, but, but as we got toward the rim, which on the picture on the left is uh, just above that, uh, those, uh, uh, those cliffs on the left, uh, it got to be really beautiful and really, really interesting uh, scrambling at that point. Um, so we, um, yeah, um, we, um, took our time 
pole pole. Uh, took our time. We stopped for rests. Uh, um, I mean, we wanted to get up because uh, if there was any objective danger, we wanted to get uh, get around that. But the, but the closer we got up, uh, the uh, the less objective danger there was, and uh, we uh, I don't remember the time, Tom. Do you remember what time we uh, we 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 breached the rim? I think it was maybe close to uh, ten thirty or eleven. We breached the rim. Yeah, that was that was what I was thinking, Jeff. Yeah, it was probably probably you know, between ten and eleven. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, so we got up to the, we got up to the rim, popped over, uh, took a rest there, um, uh, had some, uh, uh, had some good, good laughing, some good stories. We shared some, uh, uh, shared some good times. And of course, Tom had to do a, a snow angel. Had to be done. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, it's a must do. Uh, it's Rashid on the left. And um, we uh, we spent a little bit of time there, and then we walked over to the uh, uh, then we walked over to the glacier, uh, to uh, uh, which is this uh, crazy this uh, crazy glacier which is standing at the very top, which is uh, unfortunately melting. There, uh, uh, I think uh, Innocent told me that when he started guiding, which was maybe fifteen or twenty years previous to when we went up uh maybe uh, 15 uh that there had been um snow all the way down to about uh, 3,000 meters but that certainly wasn't the case here mm -hmm. and i see pictures from just a few years ago that this uh uh that this glacier was uh, uh was a lot higher so we got to the glacier spent a little bit of time there took some pictures but then we had to go uh but then we had to go up to the um uh we had to go up to the summit uh, and uh, 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 the Hurro Peak uh, is about uh, is probably about three or four hundred feet higher than uh, higher than the crater rim, and by that time it was getting hot, and uh, so we had to go up this uh, up the left or up the left portion of this uh, of this snow field, and uh, it was it's like one of those days in the middle of the day when you're going up a glacier. It was just so incredibly hot. And uh, by that time, I don't know what the temperature was outside, but uh, we were just uh, uh, very hot and sweating. It wasn't a long way, but uh, we got up to the top and uh, got to the summit. Uh, had our uh, had our great uh, uh, had our great summit uh, uh, celebration. Uh, the whole team assembled here, uh, and it started to cloud over. Uh, that's uh, it was it was. It was the early afternoon by that time, and uh, kind of the kind of the routine is that the mornings are beautiful, and then it starts to cloud over in the afternoon, get a little rain in the middle of the afternoon, and then it clears up again at night. So after we after we reached the summit, uh, as Tom mentioned, we had decided earlier that we wouldn't stay on the summit, uh, and I think uh, all of us were kind of happy about that, even though we had a long downhill slog. Uh, on the way down. Uh, it was a little bit cloudy, overcast. There were some other incredible glaciers on the on the way down, uh, but it, uh, in honesty, it was a uh, it was just a long slog. We had about we had about seven thousand feet to go down to the Millennium Camp. Up at the top, it's uh, fairly steep, and this is where the trekking poles really came in handy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of knee fatigue. Um, I think I lost a couple of toenails on the way down. Uh, but uh, it, it was it was a long it was a long trip. Uh, the cool thing was when we got to the Millennium Camp, um, probably about probably about a mile or a mile and a half uh, from the Millennium Camp, uh, the uh, the other uh, members of the team had gone down to the camp and the and the whole thing was set up, and so about a mile and a half up the trail. As we were going down the Millennium Camp, we had a, a group of porters come up and to carry our gear down. Right, they they were at the camp and they came up to carry our gear down and to give us a drink or give us something to eat. And uh, so we were we were relieved of our uh, of our heavy packs about a about a mile and a half before we got to the Millennium Camp. And uh, we got back there and of course we had the mess tent uh, tent set up and the and the suit made, and we were able to uh, able to take off our shoes and kick back. And uh, so that, it's just a, it's just another example of how uh, of how incredible the team was. 
Yeah. So definitely, you know, I think it was probably what thirteen or fourteen hour day. So you know, I mean, relative to you know to some stuff that, that probably many of us have already have done is you know not necessarily as long, but it was hard. And I I think um, you know for me anyway that that hike down from the summit to Millennium Camp was that was, that was the probably the hardest part of the trip was was actually the downhill going into Millennium Camp. I don't know about you, Jeff, but that was yeah. my sense. I think so. I think so. So, um, yeah, so the Millennium Camp to the Moike Gate, um, we had, uh, uh, we had our, uh, our goodbye celebration with the support team, uh, and we weren't able to show the video at the beginning of the, of the, um, uh, of the presentation, but this is, a, this is an opportunity for us all to celebrate uh, the incredible trip that we had. We made a lot of incredible friends. Uh, I mean, a lot of really long lasting friends, as you can see, we, we still remain friends with a lot of people. I still, we still communicate with, uh, with, with Safe and Rashid and with, uh, and with Innocent and others. And, uh, you know, this is, also, uh, uh, this is also a time when we're able to offer appreciation for, for the incredible job that the guides and the porters and the entire team did. Um, we, uh, we got some instruction. We got some instruction in tipping, which is a really important part of the um, of, of the compensation that the guys and the porters get. Uh, and uh, we had. Um, I I really hope maybe we can uh, post this somewhere, Tom. But the uh, but the video we have of the uh, of the celebration with uh, John leading the uh, leading the group was uh, was a really an inspirational mm -hmm. an inspirational morning. It was a really, really incredible day. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then we, um, after we, after we left the Millennium Camp, we had about another seven thousand feet to come down. This is uh, this is just before we broke camp on the way down, and uh, and of course it was another beautiful morning. Um, we broke camp and uh, headed down. Uh, it was really pretty uneventful uh, to get to the Mueke Camp uh, uh, at about uh, thirty-one hundred meters. Uh, which we had to go down a little bit more, but we, but this was an opportunity. This was an opportunity for us to take uh, some, uh, some goodbye photos. On the left is Moody, one of our guys, in the middle is Rashid, and on the right is uh, Innocent with Ben. And um, uh, we have a couple other ones, I think, with uh, with other group members, uh, Tom and some of the team, Steve uh, with Innocent. Uh, Really, just uh, you know, uh, an opportunity to to express our appreciation. And uh, at the end, at the end, uh, uh, a safe in the team, safe came up, and, and they met us at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the bottom, and we and we had a rock party. Mm -hmm. And and so the rock party was where we uh, where we got the certificates. Uh, all the guys and porters were there. We got a we got a chance to get a beer and to get some get some good food and to uh, and to have the presentations of the uh, uh, of the certificates of accomplishment for uh, for summiting. And then this is a very important part. Yeah. So tip number nine is obviously do some good. And uh, this this is a picture of of, of Safe with. Um, with some kids at an orphanage that he helps to support. And, um, you know, um, I think we were all struck by just how wonderful the people are in, in Tanzania. And, um, but also um, it's, it's a country that, um, that is, that, you know, is pretty poor. And, um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, as a Westerner traveling to a country like Tanzania, you have the opportunity to really, you know, experience the culture but you also have the opportunity to do some good. And so, you know, one of the things we chose to do at the end of the trip was to make a contribution to, uh, to the orphanage there in Moshi. And, um, and on this next page, um, you see a picture of, uh, of some of the food that, um, that, that SAFE um, was able to provide for them. Um, but the other thing that's, um, that's an important thing to know um, going, going over uh, to do a climb like Kilimanjaro is that, and you can see in this picture in the upper left here with uh, with John and Rashid and the the, the porters. Um, 
that you know the the gear that they're wearing is um is really modest and you know um there's there's people that are uh the reporters that are climbing in tennis shoes or even sandals and so um one of the traditions of climbing kilimanjaro is um is passing on some of your some of your gear and so i think each of us in our in our group um left a pair of boots or a sleeping bag or a jacket or you know other other gear that can help to um to outfit the um the porters and the guides that are working so hard on this mountain and providing a really wonderful experience for all of us that that go there and climb on their mountain and so you know i would really encourage you to to think about that if you're going to do a tour on um or do a climb on kilimanjaro or or uh, you know go over and and do you know do it um, a safari or some local community and really you know leave a little bit of a legacy behind and then, um, you know, similar to uh, one of the first tips, which was don't be in a hurry uh, when you when you arrive. Um, don't be in a hurry to get home either. Uh, <laughs> there's there's um, there's a lot to do in um, in a country like Tanzania, other than just climb a mountain. And so um, I think, you know, when I was originally thinking about this trip, I was kind of mostly fixated on the climb itself. And I almost wish we had added a few a few extra days on the front end or the back end because it's really amazing. So, um, so about half our group ended up doing a um, doing a coffee plantation tour afterwards. I think Jeff and um, Jeff and Steve. Uh, this is some, these are some pictures of the, of that tour. And then uh, Nell and Katie and myself and Ben um, did a safari. And I think our our safari was three or four days. Um, we went to Norngoro to um to the um serengeti and then also to um gosh what was the name of the last last one safe might have to might need to help me out with the with the uh, last one but anyway just got to see some amazing some amazing things so here's just a few pictures we could we could go on for hours about the about our um about our safari but it's really remarkable so um so definitely would uh would strongly encourage you to to stay on and and add a few days onto your trip and, and, um, and just experience all the other wondrous things about going to East Africa. So um, we're, we're about at the end here. Uh, Jeff and I think wanted to, to spend a few minutes to talk about some gear recommendations and then some other resources, and then we'll open it up for, uh, for questions. But um, Jeff, you wanna kick off some gear recommendations? Sure. Um, it, so the so the guide uh, the guide um, the the guide limitation is about is for for uh, for thirty three pounds max uh, in a in a waterproof duffel uh, so so basically you need that what you have in your gear a maximum of thirty three pounds and that includes your sleeping bag anything else any other things you want to bring with you and then you can carry whatever you want and you know we. Uh, I think we we typically uh, most of us took like a 20 to uh, 30 liter day pack. Uh, obviously, boots are uh, are very important. I wasn't happy with my boots. I bought uh, uh, a few months before supposedly the same boots uh, of uh, uh, that were no longer produced from uh, from Scarpa, and they didn't they didn't work as uh, as well as I'd hoped. But uh, but you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, rain gear, as I mentioned a couple of times, there's, there's a surprising amount of, gear, of, uh, uh, of rain in the afternoon. So uh, we, were, we were recommended by the guides and by Safe and his team to, uh, to make sure we had rain gear and we were all happy we did. We're kind of poo-pooing it on the, on the front end. We're really, really glad we did. Yeah, and then, um, you know, depending on, on how warm or cold you sleep, um, a warm sleeping bag is um, is is really the thing to have. have, have. I, I tend to sleep pretty cold, so I think I was in a zero degree bag, and um, I think that you know maybe some others had it slightly warmer, but um, but it does get really cold. Like Lava Tower was probably um, that was probably one of the coldest nights, and um, I I was cold in a zero degree bag, so. You know, I think that carrying a warm sleeping bag is um, is a good idea. Um, it does, you know, um, frequently get below t uh, below freezing. So um, whether you're using water bottles, I tend to use water bottles instead of um, a Camelback. But um, if you use a Camelback or some kind of another hydration system, just make sure that it works in freezing temperatures and have a backup there. 
Um, Jeff talked about like, you know, that, that hike down from the, um, from Uhuru to Millennium Camp was, it was 7,000 vertical downhill. And so, um, you know, the trekking poles are great for the uphills, but especially for the down, for the downhills are really good. Um, all of us had, you know, warm, warm down jackets. That's, that's essential. I had down pants and I think, I think, um, team Kaka teased me the first time I pulled them out. But by the time we got to Lava Tower and to Arrow Glacier, there was no teasing. So down pants are great, personally. <laughs> uh, comfy camp shoes are, are, um, are a must. Okay, so tent number, number one and number two. So you can see this picture of Nell over here. And there's this little, there's this little tent. And that was tent number one and number two. It's for going number one and number two. Well, actually, really mostly number two. But um, but we we uh, our our tents were all numbered. I think that Jeff and and Steve were in number three. Ben and I were number four, and Nell and Katie were number five. And we were like, what? Where? Where is where is number one and number two? We determined that this is number number two. But um, but anyway, um, you can you can pay a little bit of extra and have a toilet tent, and it's a good thing. So I, I would recommend that for sure. Anything we missed, Jeff? Helmets, I it was was one that you yeah. know Jeff mentioned, mentioned earlier. If you're going to do the the the, uh, the Western Breach, a helmet is is, is really recommended. Um, depending on the conditions, um, you know, either micro spikes or crampons would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, and actually the helmets were a good leave behind too. I think we we all left our yeah absolutely uh, helmets so behind yeah left our helmets. yeah. Yeah, so a couple resources. Um, there's more information on the, on the Western Breach, um, uh, a safe Juma's guide service, uh, KiliAfricaTours.com. Uh, um, you know, local company, outstanding service. I mean, both Tom and I would highly recommend it. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are other guide companies, but I mean, we, we can't imagine that, they, that we would have had a, had a better time and, they, and the amount of care that was taken was incredible. Um, uh, we'd all recommend travel rescue insurance. Uh, it probably won't be needed, but however, we did see uh, there were a number, we did see a couple of helicopter rescues while we were on the mountain. I think there was a picture of that uh, in, in, in one of the slides and a lot of times that won't be covered, but if you have a uh, supplemental travel insurance, here's a couple of, couple of resources for that. And then a couple of other uh, couple of other resources uh, that are down below for which are, uh, which you can access if it'd be useful. Great. So we're, we're about at 8.15. We can maybe do like about 15 minutes or so of uh, questions if, um, if anyone would like to either type something in the chat box or unmute yourself and, um, and ask a question. Uh, there's a question here about the steepest grade. Um, yeah, steepest grade. Um, gosh, I wouldn't know how to say it in terms of a grade, but as I say, it was typically, I, I'd say, uh, not much more than class two scrambling. There were a couple of uh, class three sections. Would you say that that's, that's reasonable, Tom? Yeah, I, would, I, I think that's right, Jeff. I mean, I, there were, you know, there were definitely sections of the Western Reach that, that were probably class three. The thing that I worried about the most and was being really mindful of is that, you know, you're, you're approaching um, 19,000 feet. And so, you know, it's, um, it's, you know, you're, you're working hard and, and you're maybe a little bit lightheaded. And so just being very deliberate about your motion and everything. But, um, but I didn't, you know, relative to, stuff that many of us do in the Cascades. You know, I didn't feel like it was, um, like it was overly technical if you've done some scrambling or, you know, um, even, even some just, you know, backpacking or hiking here in the Northwest. Oh, what kind of conditioning did you do to prepare? Uh, more than for Rainier? I don't know about you, Jeff. I, I mean, I, I think for most of us, we did, you know, we did, we did, um, you know, like a, like a little bit of, um, you know, hiking with, you know, whether it was going up to Camp Muir or, um, 
you know, mailbox peak, um, a lot of, a lot of the kind of typical kinds of things you do to, um, you know, to get training. But I think that hiking with a, with a day pack and getting, you know, getting the vertical and doing the up and down is probably the best way. But I didn't honestly go crazy on conditioning and, and felt pretty good. And I, I felt like, you know, our team was in, you know, good fitness, but I don't feel like anyone went really over the top in terms of like a, 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 a fitness program per se. I don't know. Is that fair, Jeff? Or Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I think that, uh, that we all took it pretty seriously. I mean, I think that uh, you know, we went, uh, we traveled at the end of January. And so in the month, in the month of, uh, in the month of December and January, it's tough to find a lot of vertical. Uh, so we, uh, uh, I think we did uh did a hell of a lot of uh, hikes up, uh, up up mailbox peak and uh, Tenerife and uh, Mount Sai and uh, and the usual suspects. Uh, I mean, but uh, but I think that um, that the conditioning was was really adequate. I think what is kind of the unknown is the altitude. Um, yeah. So that's well, that's a good point. And I and one thing you know that I would say is that our itinerary. It worked out pretty well for our group, but if you're if you haven't been to to um, to higher elevations before, I think our itinerary might have been a little bit aggressive, yeah. and, and I would almost recommend doing this as an eight day trip and um, and in the middle potentially doing you know maybe even like going to Arrow to uh, to Lava Tower, hiking up to Arrow Glacier, then coming back down to lava tower and sleeping low but i think you know uh, haven't been to higher elevations before and know how your body's going to respond then you know this itinerary might have been a little bit aggressive yeah there's another question about the uh, about can the route be done without porters are there any water sources through the route to save on weight um and the answer is no you can't do it without porters uh, by uh uh, a Tanzanian law, uh, or by the by the regulations, you need to have a guide and you need to have porters. It, uh, it, uh, it supports the local economy, and uh, they have determined that uh, that uh, that the that climbing in the in the national park will be done with uh, guides and porters, uh, and and uh, um, other uh, local water sources. I mean, all the water was actually carried up. Uh, all the water was carried up, I believe. So. Uh, yeah, and that's that. That's actually one of the reasons that uh, that you need such a big support team because everything everything is carried up from from the bottom of the mountain. There, there um, are some there are some waterfalls along the way. Like for example, like there's a you know there's a little bit of a creek that runs. Um, I think from like I think basically it's fed by Arrow Glacier um, that comes down and goes by Lava Tower, and so I, I believe that the porters were able to get some water here and there, but. Um, but it's, it's scarce, you know, and so water, water is definitely at a premium on the mountain. Um, there's another couple of questions about food illness or stomach issues. And, you know, there were, there were a couple of those, um, uh, yeah, you know, a couple of, a couple of folks, um, when we were at, um, Arrow Glacier weren't feeling really well. And in fact, one member of our party, you know, was, um, was potentially going to, you know, going to need to be evacuated from, um, from Arrow Glacier and was able to power through it, and um, and we ended up summoning as a group. Um, but um, you know, but I I was I was um, super impressed at the the just the handling of food and water and you know like I had never felt like you know like um, even though I like I had I had you know, purification tablets with me and everything I never I never used them on the mountain I, I felt really confident in the way that. Um, the food was being handled and that water was being purified and and um and i think most of us didn't didn't have uh gi issues and everything so yeah as it, uh, as i said earlier uh i i have got uh i've got uh, gluten gluten issues and so i was really impressed with the uh with the level of care that was taken to address that in fact there were there were uh, there were several meals where i would i got a uh specially prepared uh part of the meal uh, where there was uh, care taken that there was no uh, gluten introduced into it. And so uh, I, um, I, I didn't have any stomach issues, which I was very pleased about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the food was terrific. Yeah. 
In Godson we trust. In Godson we trust. Any other last questions? Um, Safe, anything that you'd like to you'd like to add? We we were just we were so thrilled to work with Safe and and his whole crew. Um, he just he just works with a wonderful group of people. And um, honestly, you know, when people ask me about this climb, oh, it it is an interesting interesting climb, but it's a but it's a cultural experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. Um, well, I think that's um, that's that's probably it as a, as a wrap. Um, we really appreciate all of you joining us tonight. Um, if you want to learn more about the Mountaineers, for those of you that um, that are not familiar with us, uh, visit us at mountaineers.org. And if you um, are inspired by our mission, um, we you know we'd encourage you to to think about making a gift to the Mountaineers at mountaineers.org. Donate. Um, but uh, but thanks and reach out to, to any one of us if um, if we can be helpful as, as you're planning your your trip to uh, Kilimanjaro and to Tanzania um, and we'll um, I think we'll be, be able to share the presentation itself as well as the video that we weren't able to um, to share with you um, in case you have uh, additional questions or or uh, want to check that out after the fact. Yeah, and I'd like to give a special thanks for uh, for Safe and for and for Rashid and uh, 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 and if anyone else is there, I didn't see uh, I didn't see Innocent or Moody, uh, but if you were there, uh, thanks so much for getting up very early in the morning, in the morning yeah. to yeah. to rejoin our presentation. It was great, and uh, we really appreciate your friendship, and we really appreciate the uh, the incredible experiences that we had, and that uh, hopefully we'll have more of in the future.